Okay, let's go over what the experts know. Bigfoot exists. So I had seen firsthand evidence of something being out there that left these gigantic footprints. First pair I ever found were 14 and a half inches, and the step length was 60 inches. Indisputable facts. And we now no longer have to talk about, oh, do you believe Sasquatch exists, yada, yada, yeah, it exists. There's no question about that. They exist as much as Irish people exist. That beer tastes good. You know, pizza's magnificent. These are all facts. Yes, got it. Sasquatch is as real as the hand in front of my face. There's no evidence of Sasquatch. Okay, Bigfoot doesn't exist. Footprints are not evidence because you did not see what made the footprint. There's not a shred of proof, not a single drop of evidence. No one's ever found evidence of unicorns or leprechauns or fairies. We're resigned to believe that that's, you know, that's folklore, it's myth. But Sasquatch is different. It's in the, the, the trace evidence. It's in the physical evidence. Right. The physical evidence, like footprints and poop. And we know. Fairies are fake, so are unicorns. Because unlike those guys, we've got photo and video of Bigfoot. Grainy videos, blurry photographs. That's not evidence. It's not? Okay, right. So none of those count. Well, other people found hair and said, well, it's primate, but it's not gorilla or orangutan or human. We don't know what it is. Hair. Great. But I'm really confused now. Yes, we have evidence, or no, we have nothing. Because all of this back and forth is giving me whiplash. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of consensus on Bigfoot evidence, and opinions on what counts as solid proof vary widely. So it looks like we're going to have to go through it piece by piece and figure out exactly what it all adds up to. I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing a series about Sasquatch, science, and society, the search for Bigfoot, and why we want so badly for it to be real. Now, there is a ton of stuff that people call Bigfoot evidence, way too much to get through all in one go. So for this episode, I have to narrow it down, and I'm really just looking at three things that Squatchers mention repeatedly. Footprints, sounds, and photographs. But before we get into those, let's talk about the one piece of evidence that would settle this whole debate. The Holy Grail. The proof that my cousin Grover sought above all others. Almost any scientist will tell you uh, in no uncertain terms that you will prove the existence of the Bigfoot or Sasquatch by bringing in a body or a substantial piece of one. No other evidence is proof. A body or a big piece of a body. Wouldn't that be great? Grover knew how important this was, and here he is explaining why. All manner of other evidence can be misinterpreted and potentially fakeable, or at least some of it can. Therefore, they will assume all of it is faked or misinterpreted until you bring in something that is unquestionable. This is the linchpin to the whole mystery, and Squatchers talk constantly about the need for a body and how someone needs to bring in a Bigfoot, dead or alive. That's the evidence they want. Grover was not the least bit squeamish about killing one, and he didn't keep that viewpoint to himself. A 1988 newspaper article quoted him as saying, If at all possible, we will kill it and bring back as much of it as we can. I'm pretty sure Grover never anticipated what would happen next. The article ran in a ton of newspapers around the country, and people were pissed. Never mind if they believed in Bigfoot or not. They were furious, and they did not hold back. Like Ken Holstein. Here's a section of the letter he sent to Grover, read aloud. Some people might want final proof of a Grover Krantz. Do you suggest someone shoot you? Leave Sasquatch alone. If the creature does exist, learn to exist with him or her. Grover held on to several of these letters, and I found them when I went through his papers, which are archived at the Smithsonian. More on that later. He didn't keep them all, but it was abundantly clear that Ken Holstein wasn't the only person to write him, because also in those files was a copy of a form letter that Grover had written, a canned response. To concerned individuals, 
Your recent letter about my Bigfoot or Sasquatch investigation was triggered by a recently circulated news item from the Associated Press. Unfortunately for both of us, you were badly misled by an inaccurate and incomplete story. There have been so many responses like yours that I've resorted to a form letter. Sorry. It seems he got so many angry letters that he couldn't reply to them all individually. That whole bring in a Bigfoot dead or alive turned out to be pretty damn contentious. And the debate over to kill or not to kill has raged on ever since. Well, I I am pro-kill because I am a scientist. And as a scientist, that is just how science is done. Quite the opposite, sorry. Um, I don't shoot anymore. If I saw one, I wouldn't shoot it. Supposing the one you shoot is the last one. I love what uh, Grover Krantz said. He was asked once, what would be the first thing you would do if you shot one? Because Grover was an advocate of uh, collecting a type specimen. Um, and Grover thought for minutes, is first thing I would do if I shot one is reload. But in an ideal world, I think Grover hoped someone would just find a dead one. A Sasquatch that had been hit by a truck or succumbed to a natural death. In fact, Grover had a whole plan for how he would find an expired Sasquatch. Well, right now I'm trying to uh, make a homemade helicopter fly. Um, a homemade helicopter? I want to use it as an observation platform, and possibly from the helicopter I would use an infrared heat sensor, try to locate a dead decomposing body. The idea here is to to see if we could find a body without shooting one. I kind of love him. I mean... This is pretty half-baked, and if you're serious about finding a body, why build a helicopter? Why not rent one? It couldn't have been that much more expensive, and might have been a better use of his time, even though he thought finding a body would probably be a long shot. Well, with all of the human activity over the last two centuries in the Pacific Northwest, I might point out that um, nobody has yet come in with a body of a bear, unless it was killed by human action. The bodies of animals that die a natural death and have the ability to choose their place of dying are notoriously difficult to find. And there's at least a hundred bears out there for every one Sasquatch. So uh, the lack of a body uh, discovered doesn't bother me at all. He made this argument a lot, apparently. People who knew him said he got the, why don't we have a body question all the time. And he'd respond with that bear example. I've been hiking and camping my whole life, and I can count on two hands the number of times I've seen live bears. I can't say I've ever seen a dead one. So that could explain why no one has found a Bigfoot corpse. But how about some bones, at least? I put that question to Peter Byrne. Um, Here in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have a scavenger system, a very efficient scavenger system. He's a 93-year-old Bigfoot hunter, and he's been searching for Bigfoot for over half a century. And he had an answer for me. When something dies, it is eaten by scavengers. And the principal garbage man, we call him, is the bear. After that, we have uh, coyotes, we have porcupines, um, we have crows, ravens. So Bigfoot dies, and you have 400 pounds of um, remains lying there. It won't take long for it to to be disposed of by bears, mainly. The delicious stench of a decaying Bigfoot draws them in, and they gobble it up, including the bones. So no body, no bones. But let's get back to the evidence that people do believe exists, starting with the item that's most commonly found, footprints. I have looked at a lot of casts of supposed Bigfoot prints, had long conversations with people who've analyzed them, and even went to a lecture at a Sasquatch symposium just on tracks. So, so Sasquatch tracks have a scientific name. The speaker was Dr. Jeff Meldrum. He's the anthropology professor at Idaho State University, who we met in the previous episode. And like Grover, footprints were his gateway into studying Sasquatch. It was remarkable. There were there was a long line of tracks, 35, 45 individual, clear, unmistakable tracks. I mean, these were either extremely cleverly hoaxed or they were the real thing. There was no misidentification, no ambiguity about it. Apparently, thousands of sets of footprints have been found in stream beds and snowdrifts, near construction sites and on logging roads, and deep in the woods, 
Many have the kind of anatomical details that make anthropologists sit up and take notice, like where the foot flexes, or how the weight is distributed, or a deformity that seems impossible to fake, like the track that intrigued Grover. A pair of footprints. One of them was obviously crippled. The design of foot that's implied by the crippling was exactly what you would expect for uh, a creature about eight feet tall and enormously heavy. In other words, they're convincing, even to those with a trained eye. But there are some that are definitely fakes. And Grover, a man well-versed in Bigfoot biomechanics, knew this. Hell, the man owned a set of wooden feet nailed onto a pair of boots. He used them to show what fake footprints would look like. Flat, featureless, unrealistic. That's why he didn't think all of them were fake. Many were just too accurate. And there's really only two choices when you look at a lot of them. Uh, They are either fabricated by a human hoaxer or they are made by the Sasquatch. And when you consider the possibilities and the difficulties and the requirements for a hoaxer to do not some, but all of them, you find you run into an absolutely impossible situation. The way I like to put it is uh, the Sasquatch is ridiculous. The alternative of a hoaxer is impossible. Therefore, the ridiculous must be true. I'm not sure this statement stands up in court, but here's the bigger problem. Even if there really are thousands of footprints... Footprints are not evidence. It's a piece of the puzzle. It doesn't prove shit. Rick Riolo, who starred on Spike TV's $10 million Bigfoot bounty, is well known among the serious Bigfoot researchers for speaking his mind. Because you did not see what made the footprint. You don't have video documentation or photographic evidence of something making the footprint. We don't have any evidence of Sasquatch doing that. So people will then begin to create their own reasons for it. Science fiction gets involved. Because Bigfoot disappears into the woods, people call it cloaking. Wait, time out. Cloaking? Like going invisible? How does that work? A Bigfoot just leaves footprints, but because you don't actually see it, it's cloaking? When you think about Bigfoot, if it's real, it's big, it's hairy, it's dirty, and it's got leaves, and it's got twigs, and it's they don't have brushes. They don't like brush their hair like Marsha Brady, 1001, 1002. No, they're, they're a mess, okay? Like a big, dirty ghillie suit. So if, imagine a walking ghillie suit walking into the woods. It's gone. You, it's so merged with the trees and the brush, you're not going to see it anymore. But people call it cloaking. Richter Riolo rolls his eyes the whole time he's explaining this. And he doesn't have much patience for people with magical ideas about Bigfoot behavior. Things like cloaking and telepathy and interdimensional travel. No animal on this planet cloaks. That's Star Trek. That's the Klingons, a fictitious alien race that goes to war with humans in, like, the year 2300. This segment of the Bigfoot crowd who believes stuff like this, they're called the Woo. And we'll hear more about them in another episode. But Riolo has made a name for himself by poking fun at them. What makes sense? You know, you, you, got, you, can't, you got to pull your head out of your ass. Now, Riolo does think that non-cloaking Bigfoot is out there. He just hasn't seen any real proof. There is an ounce of truth, but there's a gallon of bullshit. So you got to get rid of that gallon. You know, weed out the bad ones from the good and you're going to find it. Even though many people, including Grover, consider footprints to be the strongest proof of Bigfoot's existence, I have to agree with Riolo. Unless you see what made those prints, you don't know what actually did. Okay, so in a nutshell, that covers footprints. There's a lot more information out there, which you can find online. But I need to move on. If you're enjoying Wild Thing and want to support the show, consider becoming a premium subscriber. You'll get new episodes early, plus exclusive access to the bonus episodes from all three seasons, not to mention the warm, fuzzy feeling that comes from being a patron of the arts. Sound enticing? Go to wildthingpodcast.com for more information on how to become a premium subscriber. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. And thank you. Your support means a lot. Let's take a look at what other supposed evidence is out there. <laughs> Grunts, whistles, snarls, chirps, howls. 
Almost everyone I talk to reports hearing strange sounds in the woods. I've heard vocalizations that I couldn't uh, peg. The turning point came when we were camping and this loud, was it a scream, was it a howl? And I, I can't describe it as any of those, but it was powerful. It let out a holler that would lift the hair right off the back of your head. Raise your hand if you too have heard weird sounds in the woods. My hand is definitely up. Owls, bears, squirrels. One of the worst things I ever heard is a screaming bunny. That'll set your teeth on edge. But if you don't see what's making the noise, well, it could be anything. The first thing you have to do with any evidence you come across is to eliminate every other possibility of what left that track or what broke that tree or... Uh, and, and until you've eliminated everything else, you know, you can't, you can't just arbitrarily uh, identify it as, as, as Bigfoot. Same problem as the footprints. If you can't see who or what is making the sound, it's not evidence. Moving on, what about all those photographs that have been taken over the years? I don't know of any cryptid that has more documented evidence than Bigfoot. If you just Google Bigfoot and Sasquatch, you'll come up with somewhere around 11 million hits. So videos, stories, photographs, I mean, just the evidence is overwhelming. But I'm finding that the thousands of photos and videos out there are cursed with a fatal flaw. They are so very, very blurry. I asked a few serious Sasquatch researchers about this, and it turns out that they've got a name for those indecipherable shapes. Blob squatches. Blob squatch is a picture is of something that somebody says is a, a Bigfoot, but it's, indis- yeah, it's indistinguishable. It could it's be anything. It's a burnt stump. It could be a burnt stump. <laughs> or a shadow. Or, yeah. Nothing at all. Or nothing at all. <laughs> Bad lighting, sun flares, too much contrast. They're a photographic nightmare. Here's the thing, though. In these modern, technologically advanced times, almost everyone has a camera in their pocket. So how is it that there's not a single, crystal clear image of Bigfoot out there? I put that question to Jeff Meldrum. People are pretty much lousy photographers. And if they actually know what they're seeing, you know, so many of them, they're, they're discovering it in the background after the fact. And if they know what they're seeing, they don't have the composure sometimes to even take the picture, let alone get a good one. I'll buy that in some cases, but that can't be true every single time. What else you got? We we had a guy who spoke at the Idaho Museum of Natural History, and he had these beautiful pictures of wolverines. And I went up to him afterward and I said, you know, I'm quite interested in this. This is your ability to get a, a picture of such a rare and elusive secretive animal. And he, I said, how did you do that? He goes, well, you caught me. <laughs> he said, you know that one slide I showed that had a little brown spot on the snow field about, oh, about a half mile away? He said, that was the only picture that was taken in the wild. All the rest were in pens on game ranches. There are very few or no wild photographs of wolverines. They're just hard to find, hard to see, and hard to get a picture of. Okay, fair enough. It can be really hard to get a photo of elusive wildlife. I once knew a professional photographer who spent weeks trying to capture photos of wolves in Yellowstone and finally gave up and went to a nearby commercial wildlife park. Basically, he shot his photos in a zoo because he couldn't find the animals in the wild. But where he only had a week to get the shot he wanted, people have had years to get a good photo of Bigfoot. With all the game cameras, and security cameras, and drone cameras, you would think that someone would have gotten a snap of the big guy. So here's my theory. Maybe the problem isn't the photographers or the cameras. Maybe Bigfoot is just naturally blurry. The jokes. They write themselves. But before we move on from photographs, there is one piece of photographic evidence that makes me wonder just a bit. A video shot over 50 years ago, the infamous 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film. You might not know the name, I definitely didn't, but you've probably watched it. 60 seconds of extremely shaky footage of a giant, hairy, bipedal Bigfoot striding away from the camera through a clearing in a California forest. Ring a bell? 
a lot of people have seen it over the decades. The Patterson film has been scrutinized second only to the Kennedy assassination. I have no way of verifying this fact, but it sounds totally plausible. And, it turns out, this footage is the entry point for a lot of Bigfoot fans. A gateway drug of sorts. My stepfather was always talking about Bigfoot and... You know, it was intriguing. You're a little kid. You think it's interesting. And then you see the Patterson-Gimlin film, and you're like, wow, that's that's a monster. And there's just something intriguing about that. I think everyone growing up in the 70s knew that footage of, of Bigfoot walking, and as well as just the still, but that famous still with one hand behind, one hand in front. That still is known to Squatchers as frame 352. And in that brief moment, Bigfoot turned slowly to look back over her shoulder before melting away into the trees. Remember how I said Bigfoot could be a lady? Well, meet Patty. And just how did they know Patty was a lady Bigfoot? A Bigfootess? A Sasquatchette? She has tatas. Quote, large, pendulous, hairy breasts, to be exact. And this particular detail is very important. It's written about discussed in documentary films. Here the creature shows large pendulous breasts. The indication here, of course, is that it is a female creature. It came up in several of my conversations about Bigfoot. You can see muscle moving beneath the skin. She has breasts that, that balanced as she walked. I have heard a lot about Patty's breasts, and for some, they've become an object of fixation and fantasy. Drawings and paintings of Patty show her to be quite, um voluptuous. Let's just say some artistic liberties have been taken. But it's not just a bunch of dudes obsessing over breasts like I originally thought. No, this is taken as proof positive that the creature in that film could not be fake. Could not just be a man in a monkey suit. Because if you were going to build a monkey suit for tricking people, why on earth would you make it so complicated by adding breasts? If you're going to make a fake suit, why would you make a female? Like I said, and the breast thing is just one element of the film that's been scrutinized half to death. I googled Patterson-Gimlin film and ended up reading pages and pages of seriously deep analysis. Grover thought it was a compelling piece of potential evidence and often talked about how much time he devoted to going over the film. I studied the um, film every frame, measuring everything I could on the film, And um, I was able to get the dimensions and shape of it quite clearly uh, measured and the way it walked. In his papers, I found a detailed frame-by-frame breakdown of how Patty moved. The walk is also uh, peculiar. It leans forward. It keeps its knees more bent than is normal for a human. It lifts its heel higher when it lifts the foot off the ground than a human does. But it does swing its arms in a human manner. Calculations of her size and weight... Now, for one thing, the uh, creature is quite large. I would stand about six and a half feet tall, but it's especially wide. This is exactly the way an animal that uh, weighs, this is a female, weighs about 500 pounds. An animal of that size who's very strong and can walk through anything would walk in exactly that manner. No notations on bus line or cup size, though. Anyway, I can't imagine how much time he must have spent watching the damn thing. And he's not the only one. It's been put through all kinds of tests, stabilized, remastered, slowed down, sped up, color corrected, and it's been debated, endlessly debated, poo-pooed. You know, that film is fake. I got the guy that was in the suit, the guy that made the suit. Defended. How is it a man in the suit when you can see musculature? You cannot see musculature moving under any kind of material. You can't. Even Bigfoot experts don't always know what to think about it. For a long time, I always sort of kept the Patterson-Gimlin film at at arm's length. But over the years, as repeated assaults have repeatedly fallen short of that goal, I'm to the point that I'm as confident that that's real as I can be short of having stood on the sandbar and witnessed it for myself. And still, no one knows for sure. I could seriously go on for days about this. There is so much information out there. Did I mention it's only 60 seconds long? This subject is for serious Bigfoot nerds. So if you want to know more, go to the Patterson-Gimlin Wikipedia page. 
You'll find all the information and links to source materials you could ever want. Go for it. Have a great time. See you on the other side. But before I leave this topic, I have to talk about Bob Gimlin. Remember, the film is called the Patterson-Gimlin film. Roger Patterson shot it, and Bob Gimlin was the other guy who was there that day when they caught Patty on film. Patterson died years ago, but Gimlin is still kicking, wearing his Wranglers and his cowboy hat, and sporting a big silver belt buckle. And he vividly remembers what happened 50 years ago alongside Bluff Creek in Northern California. On Saturday morning, October 20th, second day after my 36th birthday, oh, we're riding up the creek bed, and uh, it was just kind of a pleasant ride. And we come around the big root system of a downfall tree. Well, Roger was in front of me, of course, and his horse just went bananas. There she was, Patty. A giant hairy thing walking in front of me at 100 yards and, uh, well, it just kept walking away. Of course, I'm saying, well, they really do exist. You know, these, these things really do exist. Cause I see this huge, muscular, hairy-covered thing walking like a human being. He's stuck by this same story for decades, despite years of ridicule and harassment. If he's lying, he's incredibly convincing. So where do I stand now? There's reason enough to think Bigfoot could fit somewhere on our evolutionary tree. But after hearing all this, I feel like there just isn't a lot of solid physical evidence. Footprints, no. Sounds, no. Photos, no. That leaves the Patterson-Gimlin film, which is intriguing, but it's not enough on its own. There is something else to consider, something that Grover never had access to, that until recently has been prohibitively expensive. D-N-A. Remember those huge ground nests from the first episode? The ones I went to see out on the Olympic Peninsula? Well, Jeff Meldrum also went to see them. Our trips didn't overlap, but we caught up on the phone later. I've seen a few bear nests in the wild. You can do it vicariously, too, just by going online. So I looked at dozens of examples. And, of course, I'm also very familiar with the types of sleeping nests, ground nests, that gorillas make. And these, he said, are similar. The situation, the circumstances, the vegetation are different, but, but that behavior of seeking out some insulation from the ground or a respite up in the trees and the ability to manipulate the branches. And it involves folding in and tucking in and braiding and plating. And I was struck when I looked at these nests. I mean, they didn't look like a heap of debris like a bear's nest looks but they looked like birds' nests because of the construction. That's what they look like to me, too. Big birds' nests. So how do we figure out what really made them? So we recently sampled the soil in the center of those nests. And I'm just working now to line up some funding. It's about 1000 bucks a pop to do an environmental DNA profile. And I have a colleague at NYU who's willing to do the work. Okay. Now I need someone to explain what environmental DNA is. As we move around the world, spitting and excreting and bleeding, even dying and decaying, we leave small fragments of DNA everywhere we go. And the new DNA sequencing technologies are so amazing that we can detect those tiny little pieces of DNA, even without a single bone present. That's Dr. Todd Disitel, the colleague that Jeff Meldrum mentioned. We met him in the last episode. He's a molecular primatologist at New York University. As he said before, he's not a Bigfoot researcher. Because to be a researcher, you need evidence and data. And to date, we have zero. We have zero biological evidence. Still, he's intrigued. And he might be able to help. I can't be a researcher of something that I don't ever say it does not exist because science can't say that. But if it does exist, I have the tools to help identify it. And now Jeff Melderman, Idaho State, looks like he's going to get access to those tools. I'm told it's a long process and it could be a while before we know more. 
So on the next episode, I want to look at another type of evidence, one that I don't quite know what to do with. Eyewitness accounts. I could hear it breathing before I heard anything else. Yeah, but it came close and it got close enough to cast a shadow and there was a rising moon that was almost full. Me and Dean are on deck cooking crabs and we heard that <laughs> whistle chirp on the beach. And then all of a sudden we saw two big shadows walking and they were bipedal. Massive upper body, big, huge triceps hanging down off the arms. And it was very light colored. The tales are compelling. The storytellers, sincere. But eyewitness accounts are, well, tricky. Eye to eye with Bigfoot on the next episode of Wild Thing. Later this week, you can hear a special bonus episode, our extended interview with Bob Gimlin, half of the team that shot the most famous Bigfoot film ever. Want to show some evidence of your love for this show? Leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. This really helps us get the word out about Wild Thing. And go to our website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. We're also on the usual social media suspects. Find us at Wild Thing Pod. And if you see a Sasquatch in the wild, make sure to snap a photo, blurry or otherwise, and share it using the hashtag Wild Thing Pod. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus Inc. Special thanks to Neighbor Wilson. Wild Thing is created, reported, and produced by me, Laura Krantz, with help from Kelsey Ray. Alisa Barba is our editor. Scott Carney is our executive producer. Our music is composed by Ramtin Arablui and mixed by Sanaz Meshkinpour.